Well, thanks everybody for coming to the presentation. If you're down on that far end, you're welcome to come down here with the rest of us. Uh, we got, we've got a little bit of room for you. Um, but uh, I'll introduce myself here. My name is Lincoln Pierce. I'm a client executive with IMAG and I lead our commissioning services group. I've got Eve Van Gorp and Pablo Benitez with us here and they'll uh, be able to introduce themselves here in a few moments when they take over the bulk of the presentation that we have for you today. So we're gonna be presenting a case study uh, about a campus rebuild project for an industrial project in, in Pella, Iowa. I've got a couple of um, um, introductory slides here. Um, so it uh, was a project that took place in Pella, Iowa um, after a 2018 uh, tornado struck Vermeer's campus um, in, in Pella. It was a EF3, EF3 tornado that struck a couple of their facilities and Heath will tell you a little bit more about that. So um, questions are welcome throughout the presentation. We have uh, about a 45 minute presentation probably for you and then we'll have time for questions at the end uh, as well. So. If you are interested or need continuing education uh, credits, this uh, presentation is CEU, um, as CEUs available for you. Uh, copyright there. Um, so like I mentioned, just a brief summary of, the, of what we're about to present today uh, to you. Uh, in 2018, uh, July, a uh, tornado came through uh, central Iowa and just happened to hit directly on Vermeer's manufacturing campus, which uh, as a result of that, there was a rebuild that occurred uh, immediately starting after the, after the event happened. Uh, luckily, there was no loss of life uh, during, the, uh, during the event. And shortly after, um, cleanup started and rebuild started. And with that rebuild came new facilities, new systems, and uh, some lessons learned from the rebuild process and the commissioning that, that IMEG was um, brought in to help provide for the rebuild of the campus. So. Uh, without uh, further ado, um, we'll get to our learning objectives here and go through that and then get Heath and Pablo started. So uh, we've got four main learning objectives for you here today. The first one, we're going to talk about displacement ventilation and using displacement ventilation and some of the unique challenges and design considerations uh, for design, uh, designing the system, an industrial system with an, uh, displacement ventilation and why that was a system that was selected. Um, we're going to talk about pressure control in an industrial facility and some of the lessons learned and some of the challenges that were encountered and resolved uh, with pressure control. Um, applying the commissioning process to uh, what you might call a non-traditional system. So there was an industrial paint line system that was included as part of this project that was included in the commissioning effort. And that's a unique system. It's not something you're going to find in IECC or ASHRAE or LEED. But uh, we'll talk about how we applied the commissioning process to the industrial paint line. And then, you know, Heath is going to help provide learning objective number four, which really is the lessons learned and the owner's perspective. I think for commissioning providers in this group here, that's going to be really valuable feedback for everybody to get an understanding of from the owner's perspective. What did they learn? What would they do differently? What did they like about how the process uh, took place on their project? So. Anyway, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Heath to introduce himself and Pablo, and they'll get uh, going on the bulk of the presentation. My name is uh, Heath Van Gorp. I'm the director of facilities at Vermeer Manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> I've been in the role about two and a half years, been with the company a little over 27 years. Um, great company based in Pella, Iowa, where uh, we do a lot of manufacturing. Um, we manufacture agricultural equipment, heavy industrial equipment, service mining equipment, forestry equipment, law, a wide range of, of products. Some of them are very, very large. Some of them are really small. So we have to have a lot of flexibility in our, in our buildings and in our systems as well. Uh, as far as myself, guys, uh, my name is Pablo Benitez. I'm a senior commissioning engineer with IMEG. I've been in the industry a little bit about, uh, above uh, 15 years, uh, primarily initially as a design engineer, now as full-time commissioning engineer. And for these projects that we're gonna talk about, I served as the commission authority and project manager. So a little bit more background about Vermeer. This, this was a picture of our campus. Um, we were founded in, in Pella, Iowa. Uh, at the time of the tornado, we had um, seven manufacturing plants, a parts distribution plant, and an eco center. Um, our campus is uh, one mile in length east to west at this facility. Uh, it is where we were headquartered. Um, and 
as a result of the tornado, we lost about 400,000 square foot of manufacturing. <clears throat> this was an uh, aerial shot the day of the tornado. Uh, this was another aerial shot the day of the tornado. <clears throat> you can see the, the two plants there that we lost, plants five and six, they were deemed a total loss. We also lost the, the eco center, which was our um, chemical storage, chemical processing facility uh, on site. <clears throat> Even due to the, the amount of damage that we had, we had, we had no loss of life. We had just minor, in, minor injuries. We were really, really fortunate. We had a, uh, an early warning system. We, we practice this on a regular basis. Uh, really fortunate to, to not have anything uh, more major, major than just minor injuries. <clears throat> so the day of the tornado, our CEO uh, made a statement that Vermeer was gonna come back stronger than ever. Um, we took that as a, as a directive from him that we were gonna build a facility that took into consideration our, our future growth as a company took into consideration the flexibility that we needed to, to supply all of the wide range of products that we build. We also wanted to build in energy efficiencies and just efficiencies in our manufacturing process. That was something that was really important to us. Uh, <clears throat> and we wanted to improve the, the air quality and the space for which our, our team members worked. That was something that uh, the Vermeer family feels very por uh, passionate about. They wanted to in increase the um, space that or improve the space that the people were working in. <clears throat> like I say, one of the main goals that they wanted to do was uh, improve the working conditions. Uh, so we decided that to do a tempered air system inside of a manufacturing facility. That's something that is really, really uncommon for facilities of this size. Um, there's a lot of challenges and there was a lot of uh, questions as to how to accomplish some of those um, goals. So knowing that we're a heavy manufacturing, we bring in raw steel, we ship out uh, finished goods. Uh, and we, in this facility, we estimated we were gonna burn about 300,000 pounds of welding wire annually, <coughs> trying to condition the space, trying to um, make it energy efficient, and also meet some of the safety standards that go along with some of the manganese levels that were coming through. Um, and we wanted to do this without having to put uh, special weld helmets on top of our employees. And we wanted to do it without having uh, fume ex extraction through snorkel systems. That, that inhibited our flexibility in the space. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual commissioning of the project. Um, again, it a, was a 500,000 square foot facility, a manufacturing plant. Uh, but one of the challenges from a commissioning standpoint is that it was really more of a mixed use type of scenario. So um, before I kind of start talking specifically about the systems, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, well, what, what was in this facility. So you can kind of see this, this diagram here, the different areas of the building. And if I kind of walk you guys through it, one of the things that's pretty interesting is not just the different areas, but you could see these connecting tunnels. So there's another plant uh, adjacent to this uh, new plant where the process, the, the flow of the process starts off. So the scrap metal comes in from this uh, Legacy, what, what's the name of that? For? Legacy 7. Legacy 7. Scrap metal comes in here, goes into the um, welding area. That's where they go ahead and they start doing some of the welding. From there it moves into the paint shop. That's where they do the painting. That's where the paint system is in. And we're gonna talk a little bit about it as part of this presentation. From the paint shop comes back out into the assembly area. That's where they assemble the parts, you know, in conjunction with some that, that are delivered in, in the warehouse, you know, products that are not manufactured there, but purchased and part of the final product. And then ultimately in the assembly area goes back out through final inspection. So that's another pseudo paint area where if there was any scuffs on the, on the final product, that's where it gets touched up before it finally goes out, um, out the door. So those are, those are the different areas. So now in regards to those different areas, well, what are the different requirements in terms of temperature and relative humidity or indoor air quality? Because again, you know, we're commissioning, we're talking about HVAC here. So as you can see, um, like Heath mentioned, you know, the, the spaces were tempered. So this is 500,000 square foot area, which traditionally is 100% outside air, 100% exhaust, and typically only heated and ventilated. Now we're looking in a scenario where as part of the owner's project requirements, we wanted to temper it. So we were, looking to provide a cooling. 
Uh, in, in the pain area, you could see that there was a uh, humidification, so some tempering in the summer, some hum humidification in the winter. Now we were trying to control the upper limits of humidity, so there is some dehumidification as well in the summertime. And again, you can kind of see, you know, there are some office areas with more traditional temperatures, but you'll see the, the, the big production area, it's tempered, it's heated, and now there's hum humidification in, in the paint area. So now we're looking at a facility with all these different types of requirements, fairly large area. Now we want to talk about basis of design. So in terms of what the engineer was looking at. So, you know, the, Keith, as the client, said this is the building, this is what I'm looking for. These are the different areas that the architect helped lay out. And then we, we kind of determined what the indoor air quality requirements were. And so ultimately the design engineer looked at a couple different systems on how they were gonna serve this area. Like Heath mentioned, you know, they kind of looked at the more traditional 100% outside air, 100% exhaust systems. Again, as we all know, those are energy hogs. If you can imagine 500,000 square feet, you know, a simple one CFM a square foot, that's a lot, that's a lot of energy. Um, so they looked at that, that type of system, you know, point, point of use snorkel type systems or recirculating scrubber systems is something they kind of looked at as well. But again, that didn't really meet the requirements of, of what Vermeer was looking for. So ultimately in the main um, assembly, uh, in main welding area, they ended up going with a displacement ventilation system. That's one of the main topics that I'm gonna be talking about. But ultimately the final basis of design was 36 different uh, air handler rooftop units combination you know, most of them were gas fired in a combination of DX cooling and chill water cooling. Um, as Heath mentioned and Lincoln earlier in the presentation, there was a new uh, chilled water plant that was in, you know, built as part of this project to serve this um, facility. This was the first water cooled plant on campus. So that's another project that we simultaneously commissioned uh, in conjunction with this. So you kind of see some of the specific numbers, you know, six, six units here, seven units there, et cetera, but just 36 units, as you could imagine, it's a lot of equipment. Yes. Great question. So I'm, I'm going to dive right into that right now. So display for sure. So we're going to talk about displacement ventilation system. And in fact, a couple couple main things I want to touch touch on. Number one, what is displacement ventilation? You know, number two, what, when is it applicable? Uh, number three, what are some some of the design um, items you know parameters you have to look out for? And then the, what what are some of the benefits? Right. So in terms of what, what it is, and I think I took, took this graphic off the net, and, but you know, I think it paints a pretty good picture, but ultimately a, a displacement ventilation system is an um, air distribution system that supplies uh, laminar, low velocity, cold air at the floor level and uses uh, the heat source, you know, whether it's people or machines, to carry the air up through nat natural convection. So you can imagine you, you supply down low, it comes in contact with, with let's say, a, a piece of equipment or, or even a person. And so through natural buoyancy and convection, that air will start to gain momentum and, and eventually rise. And so this system consists of low supply air, high return, okay? One of the main things um, associated with this type of system is the supplier temperature. So in order to maintain that displacement and that buoyancy effect, convention effect that I, that I mentioned, you have to maintain somewhere around 63 to 68 degrees supplier temperature all the time. So really, you, you, if it's a traditional office space, it, it would be around that range, but in general, the rule of thumb is five to 10 degrees below the space temperature to be able to maintain that, that effect. Um, but now, because, because of that, since we are supplying 63 to 68 degrees all the time to maintain th this type of effect, this is really only meant for cooling. So the, the, this facility needed an alternate, typ typically when you implement this type of system, you will need an alternate source of heat. In this case, we have uh, infrared heaters to do, um, I, I know we noted kind of unoccupied heating there, but even no normal in the dead of winter, there is some uh, infrared heaters. Now in, in terms of when is this applicable? Well, there's a couple parameters or, um, where, where this falls into place. Number one, your ceiling height. This works well in a space that's like this, a minimum of nine feet higher than nine feet so that there's enough space for this convection effect to take place. Um, an area where there's uh, high density. So a place like this again, because you want those heat source, an internal, large internal uh, cooling load so that, you know, that heat source carries the, the air away. Um, and just in general, a place where you're okay with discharging temperature, uh, like I mentioned, um, five degrees below the space temperature. And actually one more uh, that I just thought of is, 
this is applicable to a, a place where the, the fumes or whatever the, the heat source is lighter than air. So in this case, the welding fume is lighter than air. And, and for this reason, this type of system is applicable because it will carry the, so the dirty um, air out of the space. Now, like I mentioned before, this type of diffuser is a, a laminar diffuser, low velocity diffuser. And typically when that happens, uh, we end up needing a lot more air, right? To maintain our same cooling effect, we need, you know, we, we have a smaller delta T on the air side, so we need a higher airflow. So in terms of a higher airflow, we end up needing pretty big diffusers. So this thing automatically started playing. Oh, well, there you go. We could just watch the video there for a little bit. But in general, up top, you could see some of the, is there volume control on that? So it goes a little lower, a little loud. That's good. But if you look at the top, so the, the top diffuser is, so there's a lot of suppliers out there that manufacture these drum type diffusers um, that are meant for displacement ventilation system. Again, they're fairly large. And in terms of the, you know, the welding area, that's, it's, uh, you know, the space is real estate. There's a lot of people in the space, there's welding machines. So implementing this type of diffuser um, was, would be challenging. It's gonna cover the space where all the welding equipment is gonna be at, it was intrusive. Uh, that on top of cost, um, and issues with, with uh, schedule, uh, Vermeer and the Vermeer team, um, pretty sophisticated company. They have in-house engineers who actually designed their own diffuser. So in fact, that's what you're seeing down here. As part of this project, their in-house mechanical engineers did a CFD analysis and embedded the diffuser into the welding table. So I have another picture on the next slide here in a second where they ended up coming up with a way to meet the parameters that were defined by the design team, you know, of, of around 50 feet per minute phase velocity on the diffuser, a, a 20 foot throw on, on these diffusers. And ultimately they did some CFD analysis, they put together a prototype, they tested it. And, you know, we all kind of said, okay, green light. And so they went ahead and manufactured those. Um, and one of the other things that, you know, the good thing about this diffuser that Vermeer uh, designed, be nice that we designed it, but, I want to take the credit there, is that this, this one adds flexibility. There's some perforated plates there where as you start to increase the CFM, pressure drop's going to start to increase. Well, go ahead. Is that smoke being used on the prototype to test it? Or is that no, that, that's smoke, it's a smoke test that, they, that, that was performed. Hmm. So as you look over here, that picture to the left, that's the final product. So in that welding area, all the supply diffusers are coming down vertically along the column um, and they're part of the welding table. So now, uh, you know, there's a, there's a welding wand that people go and grab and they work a couple feet away from that. Uh, supply the fuser, but ultimately it, it ended up working uh, pr pretty slick actually. So there's a bunch of these, those are about 2,000, 2,200 CFM uh, per diffuser. The, so, so good question. So that's the next part that I was getting to. So. <laughs> yes. No. So what I what I said was that this one here, if if we get to a point, this one in particular, right, because it has a fixed open area, we start in the future if they wanted to increase it, because that that was one of the one of the reasons why they started looking into going for a different diffuser is if for whatever reason instead of the 2000 CFM that was calculated by the design team, because really, really the unknowns were, you know, how much, how much uh, welding fume was gonna be produced. And so the idea is that with this type of design, since it's, it's really just open and it's just baffles that's kind of pushing the air rather than in, increasing pressure up that duct, that we could get a little bit more air out of this if we needed to in the future. As of right now though, we're still, you know, in, uh, uh, operating under normal design conditions, which was the 2200 CFM. So same CFM on both, both of them. So to your question about um, recirculating air. So again, you know, we, so lar there's a lot of CFM in the space. And so what do you do, you know, what do you do with the air? Are we gonna dump it? You know, that's a lar large energy waster. So, you know, these are uh, dust collectors. So, they, so this return air goes through a dust collector. There's MERV 15 filters in that dust collecting system. And so you can see, the, so the, these are, this is all the welding area. So these are all the units in the welding area. 
Uh, so you can see up here, you know, the, the supply is down low, exhaust is up high, comes up through a return fan that's in the dust collector, and then um, discharges it to the suction side of the return fan that supplies it back into the air handling unit. Now, again, this is one other interesting thing that we had to look at from a commissioning standpoint, you know, dust collector systems. You know, what, what is a dust collector system? How do you commission it? Um, other than a fan and a filter and differential pressure control, there's a couple other um, systems, house systems that are connected to it. You know, there's a compressed air system that gets connected to that for cleaning purposes. So, you know, we, we had to test that. Um, there's a, a fire protection for connection for in case there's a fire. Um, there are solenoid valves that have heaters on here to make sure that the solenoid valves don't freeze in the middle of winter. So again, just interesting process about having to commission this, not to mention integrated into the BAS, right? Because well, you, you have to set a pressure limit once we get too high and that those filters are no longer being cleaned by the compressed air, we want to make sure that we're um, replacing those filters. So just in general, I'm going to check how we're doing on time here. It might be running we're a little long. Halfway. Okay. So uh, just a couple quick ones, lesson learned before I move on to the next uh, topic here. Oh, and actually, here's the other side of, the, of that unit where the, was a return fan back to that rooftop unit is. 36 rooftop units, it's a lot of equipment. So really scheduling uh, and simultaneous testing in different areas was really the approach that we ended up taking. You know, a lot of poll planning meetings, a lot of, in fact, we, instead of just typical commissioning meetings, we sat in in the construction meetings. Uh, when, we were, were, when we were knee deep in it, we were having meetings every day and trying to figure out how we were going to um, schedule everyone, where we were going to position everyone. Because ultimately, a lot of these units back in here, if I go back to this area here, these six units here, the displacement ventilation system, and then the seven, six, six plus one more unit up in the assembly area operated as a system. So physically, it was six and seven different units. But the pressure control scheme, which I'll get to a little bit later, required these to all operate as a system. So what I mean by that is they all start up together, they all ramp up together, they're all doing the same fan control. The only difference would be on the discharge temperature control, they have their own stat. So again, some of the issues that we ran into, airflow calibration I listed, that's not necessarily typical of this type of building. I think from commission standpoint, we run into that a lot, but here, even more important uh, to make sure we had that working. Dust collection I talked about. I'll just mention one other big one here before I move on. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but um, the uh, gas heat section of, of these units, um, in particular the ones that were serving the paint area, are, were indirect fire to make up air units. So there was a discrepancy on what the design team thought they were gonna get from a turndown standpoint and what we needed. So those were 25,000 CFM units. Now typically, go ahead. Did you say direct or indirect? Indirect, they were indirect. Yes, they were indirect. So typically, you know, I think a lot of times we kind of look at turndown, we look at the supply fan, we look at the VFD and say, oh, you know, how, how low do we think we're gonna get that? Obviously here on a, uh, on a gas fired piece of equipment, you know, there are limitations associated with the gas fired section. So uh, design, from a design standpoint, they assumed that we could get as low as 8,000 CFM from a 25,000 CFM unit. Um, we got way less than that. You know, even if, once we contacted the manufacturer and they came out and did a couple modifications on the baffle plate, did a couple modifications on the controls and the differential pressure on the gas line, we were only able to get 15,000 CFM turned on, 25 to 15,000. So differential pressure. So in the previous talk, I talked about, you know, temperature and humidity. Now differential pressure is a big, a big item here, right? So it's a big, really big warehouse, but since we have a paint system and we have this whole area here that has welding and dirty air, you know, the pressure control is crucial. So the design um, was, was based on, on this uh, diagram that you see here. Everything's kind of negative to the welding area, paint area, since we have paint system painting going on. We don't want any dirty air going that way. Paint goes positive this way. Everything should be getting pulled out this way. Um, and then the tricky part, like I said, there's an existing building that we connected to. So there was some assumptions there, but ultimately, all the numbers that they put in the design, we all assumed it was going to work in this direction. So we're negative because we have specialized exhaust fans. Yeah. So here, so back to back to the the um, those rooftop units with the with the um, dust collectors and the return fan. Th those were uh, balanced or operated at a fixed CFM differential, so that all the makeup air is coming from up here, and so the idea is that it's going to come this way now. Um, it's going to slightly pull from here, but the idea is that it's positively pressured here in, 
in, in convention to this space down here. So yeah, traditionally you want the space to be slightly positive, but here this might be slightly negative, but it's gonna be way more negative here because of the positive pressurization that's coming from those other units. And again, like I said, you know, what is this pressure over here? Who knows? Um, another lesson learned, so the design um, was based on differential pressure measurement. They put in differential pressure sensors in the, uh, across the different spaces. Um, really because we thought, you know, when this was drawn out, you know, you kind of see walls there, you think it's, you know, different spaces, there's doors there. But ultimately, as we, start, as we get it, started getting closer to completing or in the construction process, we realized there's these really big overhead doors here that are gonna be open all the time. Because like I said at the beginning, all the process works, people are coming through here, going through there, going over there. So those doors are open all the time. So for any of you guys who have uh, worked with in you know, isolation rooms, operating rooms, you know, what happens if you open up the door? You know, differential pressure is gonna go to zero. So that, that wasn't gonna work for us. So the other thing that we had to look out for was the paint system. So the paint system had its own manufactured exhaust, own manufactured makeup air units, packaged units, that during design, there was some assumptions made on, on what the capacities were for you know, makeup air, exhaust, et cetera, and how that was gonna line up with the HVAC. So now we have a differential pressure sensor that we can't use because they're not reading correctly. We have a paint system with varying loads that we made assumptions that weren't correct. And we had makeup air units that in the dead of winter could only go down to 50% of what we originally thought. So all types of issues, you know, not to mention the connection to existing, the existing plant. So ultimately, what we ended up having to do, you know, I'm an engineer, we're engineers, what did I do? Try to crunch the numbers, right? I sat there and I said, well, what's the minimum, what's the maximum of the makeup, of the exhaust, of the, all the rooftop units? We worked out all this math and tried to come up with different configurations on how can we stage these units? Um, you know, what's the minimum amount of makeup air units that I need to run to maintain pressure? Uh, but ultimately, uh, what we ended up uh, determining is I think I kind of say it here, you know, that determined modes of operation for process equipment, um, that ended up being a lot more than, than we initially thought. You know, again, we, we were thinking there's an on off, maybe a start and a purge, maybe four or five discrete modes. It turns out to be, you know, 80 different type, 80 different operations, different firing rates, because there's ovens, there's paint systems. And so ultimately we said, okay, that's not gonna work. So what could we do? So in fact, that's item number two. Here's just an example of overhead door, even when it's closed. I mean, you're not gonna generate differential pressure uh, there, at least not good, good data. So ultimately what we did is we went back and we figured out a way to get integration of the paint line into the BAS. You know, that was not part of the original design. Um, again, some of this is exhausting, you know, dirty air, hot air. So it's not as simple as putting in an Eptron. You're, you're not gonna measure exhaust that way. So we had to not just get um, status of this equipment, we had to find a way, work with the manufacturer on trying to translate speed of some of this equipment off the drives and uh, equate that to a CFM. And so ultimately what we ended up doing here um, is maintaining pressure control from, uh, on a CFM offset basis. So what I mean by that is uh, we're getting readings and all the exhaust on the paint system and then we're modulating the house HVAC systems to make up for it based on CFM control. What was the stack on pressure-wise? Good question. It, you know, I think it was point oh, point, point oh 0.01 or something to that effect, you know. Um, um, I think we did. I, you know, I, I, that was a, you know, the project took more, more than a year and that was one, one of the lingering issues that uh, design probably called for these alarms, but realistically, unless he's wanted to get alarms every day, we had to be realistic and say, okay, maybe we can achieve a tight control. And that's really kind of the, the lesson learned is that that type of tight control is not gonna work in this type of environment. So, and I think um, from the paint system side, uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, Vermeer's a, a lean manufacturer. The paint system is really the, the linchpin in the entire manufacturing process. Everything is just in time flow. So if the paint system goes down, everybody goes home. That's not a good thing when you're trying to build product and you got customers waiting for it. So <clears throat> we had eight different conveyors. They were powered and free conveyors. Uh, total was about just a little over a mile in length. Uh, crammed into the into 100,000 square foot inside that facility. 
So the overall facility was 500,000. 100,000 of that was dedicated just to the paint side. We had five different vendors. The, these vendors reported directly up to Vermeer. They, it was owner furnished, contractor installed uh, equipment. <clears throat> it was a really tight construction schedule. We were trying to get this thing up and running um, before the building was actually turned over because we had to have this operational in order to move some equipment out of the existing legacy building into this building and trans transfer without having a, sh a massive shutdown of our production. <clears throat> there was really nobody looking at the overall system. When I say there's nobody looking at the overall system, there was five vendors in there. Vermeer was looking at the overall system, but there was nobody to do checks and balances as to these five vendors, are, are they all communicating well with each other and are they making sure that their systems are working well together? And there was nobody looking at, are these five vendors working with the building automation system and how, is that, how does that equipment impact the building, the building space, the building efficiencies? And, and there was really nobody in the oversight position of that. And I think ultimately that is where uh, Heath essentially said, hey guys, while you guys are commissioning the rest of the building, can you guys commission this paint system? So again, you know, we're engineers. Me and Lincoln talked, we said, sure, we could figure it out. So he emailed me, you know, like 10,000, some O&Ms, it was like 10,000 sheets of paper. And, you know, I said, Lincoln, what, what, what did I get myself into? Now, the good thing about, you know, I make our team's fairly large, 20, 20 plus people of, of dedicated commissioning. So we were able to ramp up and I got a separate team, another four people, simply dedicated on commissioning the paint, the paint line, while me and the other guys were focusing on the house HVAC. Because as Heath mentioned, the, the um, substantial completion date for this part of the building was faster or happening uh, quicker than the rest of the building. So we had to hurry up and ramp up um, and get this done. Now, in general, you know, the good thing about commissioning is that it's a process, it's a commissioning process that we all kind of know. And so again, we systematically, just like any other system that you might come across that we say it's, it's, mechanic, there's some, it's a machine, might have some electrical portions to it, we could figure it out, right? So we, what, we did our homework and ultimately we, we said, okay, well, what is the goal? You can see right there, 37.5 carriers uh, per hour goal, meaning you know, pieces of, of equipment that's gonna make it from the starting point. And in fact, if I go back here real quick on the paint line, you can see there's, there's you know, the, the process goes through the blaster, through the washer, through the dry oven, back through a paint booth, a series of paint booths and a flash oven, back through this IR oven, back to this cure oven, um, the goal, from, from a um, manufacturing standpoint is to make sure we had 37.5 carriers per hour. So from that standpoint, then we, we stepped back a little bit and said, okay, well, what are the modes? You know, what, what kind of modes does this equipment have? We identified what the automatic modes are. You know, what are the manual modes? Which you can't really see here, but there's a bunch of uh, human interface machines, a bunch of alarms, manual e-stops, a bunch of switches for this conveyor system, um, typical of HVAC or just MEP type systems integrated system testing. So we had to do power loss tests, fire alarm test. Because um, ultimately, for example, if, if you know, something gets bound up in the, in the um, conveyor system, the next system down the line has to know that, right? So there's a series of tests that we had to put together. And ultimately, we're gonna track deficiencies. I mean, that is a, you know, part of the commissioning process. So you know, what were some of the challenges? In fact, here are some other pictures of, of that paint system. Again, it was, it was pretty complex, not, not very typical, but um, ultimately, at the end of the day, is, here's an example of a place where you know, Heath, as our client, asked us, can we take on this? We did our homework and we were able to successfully apply the commissioning process to a non-traditional system. Now, obviously, some of the challenges, like I said, needed some simultaneous teams. You know, item number two, again, very typical of packaged equipment. We had five different vendors, not including an overall um, monitoring vendor who was going to pull all those points to a separate BAS type monitoring system just for the paint line and obviously coordination. Um, you know, that coordination was a big one. You know, the, the issue with trying to turn this on before the house plan was completed was because we're, we can't forget that the HVAC system is really providing some of that pressure control, some of that tempering. And so we couldn't really delineate, you know, the paint line versus the rest of the house uh, systems because it's all, it's all being, it's all serving the same area. In terms of the lessons learned, I'll quickly go over some here and want to see if how we're doing here, if we're doing okay. Let's go down the list on a you know, couple examples on some of the systems, you know, the conveyor system, for example. Um, 
like I mentioned, integration with, with the other uh, type of equipment. So again, you could imagine a conveyor system that's going down the line, there's you know, 18 different stops. You know, what happens when one piece of equipment is in one mode versus does the conveyor keep going? Does it stop what's going on? It, it, it does have compressed air connection, so there were some pneumatic air leaks we ran into. Uh, the shot blaster is where, where it goes through to get treated before it goes into, into the wash area and, and so, uh, subsequently the, the uh, paint area. We ran into vibration issues. We ended up having to bring in one of our structural engineers to help. You know, they put, they, uh, they had issues with this one um, vibrating to the point where some of the lights in the space were vibrating. So again, um, you know, most of us here are probably not structural engineers, but something to think about where commissioning process actually involved them too. Um, you know, that, that blaster had a packaged makeup air unit that was an interlock that we had to work through. Um, you know, washer had tank level controls, fuel sensor issues we ran into. The ovens, we actually had some IR, um, infrared camera uh, scanning done. You know, I, I, we, we kind of put the onus on the contractor team to do this, but ultimately to make sure there wasn't any um, kind of what we call temperature rollout, meaning you're not standing two feet from the washer um, and it's, you know, 300 degrees. So, uh, or uh, the oven. The paint boost and spray system, we you know, ran into some power loss issues. What happens when you lose power and you regain power? You know, what, what is that sequence of operation? What happens? And then ultimately this last one, that's the BCI monitoring system I mentioned. Um, similar to the 10,000 sheets of paper that we got from Heath, it was 10,000 data points that these guys had to integrate. So again, uh, very complex uh, system with subsystems, but ultimately, uh, we were able to apply the commissioning process and, and provide that service um, in support of Vermeer's goals. What happened when you lost power? A lot of times equipment doesn't come back automatically. You have to set up a generator where you've got everything out of the GPS. So, so good question. So I, in fact, one of the issues that we ran into is some of the controllers from the BAS standpoint weren't even on emergency power or didn't have a UPS. And so the, some of the, as Heath could attest, is there was a lot of lessons learned and kind of changes. You know, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg that I had to pick X amount for this presentation. But yes, absolutely. Typically what it does, it'll regain power, but it'll, it'll re it requires manual, um, you know, it'll turn back on, but you know, someone has to come back up and start it back up just from a safety standpoint. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea of, you know, the, the ramp up and the, the paint line commissioning and a little bit of the challenge there. I think we were, you decided to have a start on that in August because you had to be mm. painting product November 3rd. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was, <laughs> it was kind of a get ramped up quickly, but uh, like Pablo mentioned, it's a process. You apply the process and understand the equipment. And uh, I think you were painting product on November 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we so, were. so anyway, um, so chilled water system. Um, Prior to this project, you know, you saw the image of the campus, you saw all the buildings, mostly rooftop DX type cooling equipment. Um, this plant started out, the thought process from the design team was rooftop, you know, DX cooled uh, systems and equipment up there. You look at 500,000 square foot of facility and all the compressors that were gonna be up there, it was actually a local vendor who was pricing out that option who said, why don't you take a look at the chilled water plant? And Lo and behold, you've got a chilled water plant today, but there hadn't been any other chilled water plants on campus that entire mile until this one came along and Vermeer went in at a cool 4,500 tons of cooling, <laughs> you know, to, as their first chilled water plant. So uh, absolutely a new experience for them. We've commissioned chilled water plants before, but um, we, you know, we helped along the way, uh, looking at some of the options. There was the option of a, a field built chilled water plant. There was the option of a, you know, a system, a packaged chilled water plant and bring that on site. Um, in any case, uh, it was something that was going to be put in place to eventually provide chilled water cooling to the entire campus. And so you're talking about, like Heath mentioned, one mile. You looked at that overhead, that aerial picture, that, that's literally a country mile and they put the chilled water plant in the middle of that mile and they've got it set up to distribute chilled water end to end and, and eventually provide the tempering for all their facilities. Because as you can imagine, plant seven, new plant seven is now where most people wanna work because of the work conditions, the cleanliness of the air, the air quality, and that's really what they were trying to accomplish there. So there were quite a few uh, different renditions considered, you know, do you do variable primary flow? You have a huge, pro, you know, huge load. You got a lot of geography to cover a lot of end to end. You do, you know, how do you be most efficient with your pumping? 
but also variable primary flow. You know, the, if this is your first chilled water plant, do you want something that may be a little bit temperamental? I know that those systems are probably easier to control these days than they were in their first days, but still. Um, but in the end, uh, the decision was made to go with a, a primary secondary system and uh, just push that water out into the plants. There were thoughts about maybe an intermediate, you know, heat exchanger at each plant and tertiary pumping, things like that. Um, from a freeze protection standpoint, um, and a simplicity standpoint, the system's got glycol in it. And so all those rooftop units can take chilled water up to the roof. Uh, it'll be freeze proof as long as the glycol percentage is as it should be. And uh, primary secondary makes it somewhat, somewhat straightforward of a system, but even so Pablo's gonna go through uh, some of the challenges and lessons learned discovered with you know, a, a plant of this size and some of, the, some of the things learned along the way. So, Interestingly enough, on top of all the issues that we were running into in plant seven, simultaneously, we're building this chilled water plant across, across campus, they're you know, down the block, re relatively pretty close. And so this, the construction was coming down, uh, being completed in winter of, of 2020 or fall of 2020. So the question comes up is, well, how, how do you commission a chilled water plant if number one, there's nothing connected to it, right? Because we hadn't run, we hadn't connected the, the chilled water lines to all the rooftop units in plant seven. Number one, and number two, it's the middle of winter. You know, there really is no load. What are we gonna do? So uh, one thing is the design team did put in some stubs there for some temporary connections. So we were able to circulate water and we brought in a portable heat load. So that's a heat load on a trailer there that they brought in for us to, to do functional testing on that chill water plant. So you guys could see, you know, it's essentially it's a portable hot wa heating hot water plant with its own, I mean, you can't see here, but there's a heat exchanger, there's a, there's a pump. Um, and then pumps through those boilers. Now, so that, that was number one. Now, the other, the other thing that we kind of a lesson learned is that we brought this heat load over, but however, the, the tonnage on the chill earth were 50, 1,500 tons. This whole boiler plant was only able to load one chiller at 33%, okay? So although I did, we, did, we did think that through in terms of let's have a way to test them, we were only able to test each chiller at a 33% load. So there's no, there's no way for me to test parallel, you know, chiller, you know, chiller staging, parallel chiller control, uh, et cetera. So as luck would have it, the next year, summer of 2021, where we actually started using the chillers to serve the plant, and we ended up um, actually supplying, you know, putting a load on the system, uh, we ended up finding that those chillers were sent, um, you know, shipped to, to, uh, to the Vermeer campus with the incorrect number of bundles in, in the units themselves. So as installed, those units could not produce the 1,500 tons that the nameplate was rated for. In fact, I think we were only getting about 1,200 tons. So um, I think Heath could attest to the process of having to send those back and get them reshipped winter of 2021. And in fact, we're gonna be back this summer, 2022, for part two of chill yeah. water plants. So they're just being back, they're just being installed and tested next week. One and two will be tested next week. And then the, we actually purchased the fourth chiller to get us up to the 6,000 tons, plus a 300 ton air chiller that we put on the back of the facility. So we'll be up to 6,300 tons and the fourth chiller arrives May 9th. So lesson learned there is that we're gonna put in a system that we can't test and we're only gonna simulate it, but we gotta come up with a way that we're gonna be able to test the whole thing. Cause in this case, we had to, we waited a whole year almost mm -hmm. until we determined that you know the chillers had issues. Did, did they ship the whole thing back, uh, Heath, they or shipped, did they just pull out the... No, they shipped the whole thing back, okay. and then and we went down there for witness testing at the factory in Houston to watch them actually run, and then they brought them back up and, and have just started them back up. Perfect. And then the other thing, too, if we kind of go back here, you know, those are the secondary chill water lines, and, you know, at the beginning of this um, presentation, we kind of talked about the purpose of the, of the cup is because there are there is construction going on uh, in, the, in the Vermeer campus, and... You know, we're looking to extend chilled water, you know, put, as, we, as we build new buildings, we'll have chilled water coils. So, you know, there's some we're, we're converting to chilled water coils. And so one of the other issues we ran into is so if this project is phased, so what about the secondary chilled water pumps? What I mean by that is, you know, if I, we initially started with nowhere to pump, right? So I'm literally just circulating water. And then little by little, we start increasing the, the connections on the secondary chilled water site. So how are we controlling secondary chilled water pumps now? Initially, they were controlling to differential pressure. You kind of see those sensors here at the headers, 
But really the intent was as we start building buildings, we put differential pressure sensors on the distribution of each of the different facilities and we use that as feedback. Now again, this project took a couple of years and sure enough, when I show up, um, I believe last year, last summer, uh, the, we still had the pumps running off the differential pressure in the cup instead of out in the, out in the plant seven. And you know, we were running like three secondary chill water pumps full, full out um, when we didn't need to. So I don't know how long we were running that for, but ultimately, you know, the idea there, lesson learned, is we got to plan out that phasing. So what I mean by that is there's going to be future pro projects, future connection. You know, what is that new sequence of operation, and how is that going to affect you know that you know, central utility plant? And I'll touch base here on chill, the chiller uh, staging quickly. But another of the issues, you know, again, chill water staging or chiller staging. I think we could have you know presentations on chiller staging, low delta T, and all all that deal. You know probably talk hours on, on those, so I won't get into the specifics, but one of the issues we ran into, design um, sequence of operation, was looking to control chiller staging based on um, calculated um, tonnage on the secondary loop. Um, and, and there's an or statement in there with um, also looking at so, some of the, uh, on the uh, primary loop as well. Now the issue, or flow, secondary chill water flow. So now the issue we ended up having is, we started having issues with the uh, chill water flow meters. So now again, so we had a situation where we're operating way more chillers than we needed to. Um, as of right now, we've, we've implemented uh, controlling the chillers off uh, secondary chill water temperature um, on the staging up. And I know that sometimes has some issues with, you know, when do you stage down? You know, as, as of right now, we have it set staged down based on capacity of the chiller. You know, once capacity from, a, you know, a full load amps, um, after it's been running for X amount of time below a certain threshold, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of stable it. Uh, stage down to to one chiller and like we said we'll we'll be back there this summer and if we need to make any more modifications we will and Heath so the value of the commissioning uh, if we didn't get it from Pablo all the uh, issues that we've had right the system was designed and there was no ill intent it should have worked but when you actually start operating a system, there's just variables that you can't account for in the design. There's the way that the building is operated. There's the equipment that you put inside the building. There's the way that the, the uh, owner might use it in a way that, that you didn't account for, that they didn't account for. And as an owner, I just want it to work, right? I, I need it to work. I got product I got to put out. I got people that I got to keep happy. If that chiller plant goes down, and the temperature goes to 83 degrees in a plant when it's 95 degrees outside, you can imagine that we get complaints pretty quickly. It doesn't take very long. <clears throat> One thing, uh, the timing of the CX engagement. Lincoln kind of alluded to it. We brought him in on the paint line in August, said, hey, I think we went out to lunch. I said, hey, what do you think about doing this? He said, we've never done one before. And I said, well, I, you know, it'd be an interesting adventure. I'm, I'm sure you'll get it done by November. <clears throat> and lo and behold, they, they did. <clears throat> we should have had them engaged early in the design process. We should have had that put in the documents from the very beginning. And, and really, it goes back to what would I have done differently? What I would have done differently is I would have brought in the, the commissioning agents earlier. I would have taken into consideration a lot of the operations that we're gonna be running in there, the paint line was a, a major, major piece of the, the operation that we have. And it also impacted the building, it impacted the building's efficiency, and it impacted the manufacturing efficiencies inside the building. <clears throat> and all those things have to work together. And if you don't take those into consideration, you're, you're kind of fooling yourself to think that it's gonna, when you turn the, turn the lights on, it's gonna just run, because it, it, it just won't. And I think, I think the applying the commissioning process to some of these things that are out of the norm actually really helped us. And as we're building more buildings, Pablo is involved in another 300,000 foot, square foot facility that we're putting up now. Um, we, we tried to get them included very early on in that process. It's connected to the chilled water piping. We're, we're running 6,000 feet of two 24 inch chilled water pipes across our campus to feed these buildings. Um, because that was the direction that I was given the day after the tornado when my CEO said, we're gonna come back stronger than ever and we're gonna make the campus better for our employees. 
So I have a directive, and that directive has to go back to not only the design engineers, but it has to go back to the commissioning agents to check and balance the issues that are unforeseen. Really, they, they're the last defense against some of the stuff that we came, we came in contact with. Um, without them having done commissioning on the, on the, pro, on the project, uh, we probably would still be fighting a lot of the issues and we, would, we wouldn't be any better off. So um, there's a lot of value. There's a lot of value in getting them involved early. I don't need to tell you guys that. I'm sure that you guys have all been on projects where you come in at, at, at the last minute and say, why did they do that, right? So. So if you wouldn't mind just staying seated, we'll get started on the second half of our presentation here. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions for the group? We want the hum we wanted humidity in that space in the winter time because we use electric static paint. So it, if you don't have humidity in there, you run the risk of uh, of an explosion. Yeah. So that that area was humidified. So that's one of the things they briefly you know they didn't get into the specifics, but there were humidifiers in all the air handlers serving the paint area. Mm -hmm. Well, one lesson learned about humidification, air handlers, and smoke detectors is put the smoke detectors upstream of the humidifiers. <laughs> so. Um, so talk about your scope a little bit. It sounds like you're brought in late. So post design review, this is also post submittal review. And were the chillers OFD when you purchased them? I'm just trying to figure out the gap on the bundle. So so good question. So the, the chiller itself, you know, the 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 um shop drawing showed the correct product. I mean it show it showed the correct nameplate information, you know, showed 1,500 tons, just physically is where they got it wrong. And so I think we did go back to um, the manufacturer, which I won't mention, and I think they ended up saying it was something to the effect of one of their internal, you know, they have a selection program they used to, and something to that effect that when they, there's a mistake in there, because I, I think we asked about, and maybe Heath, you remember, mm -hmm. about whether or not this issue has happened before, because I said, how is that possible that your selection program is incorrect? Did they say that? Uh, I don't it, hadn't remember. Happened, it hadn't happened before. We okay. were the lucky ones. Yeah, but I think I think what they were saying, though, <laughs> had we not caught it, they're potentially they are, we're shipping others. these chillers incorrectly to other places. Yeah. So, are they paying for all the contractor rework as well, not just the product? Vermeer's not paying for it. Yeah, I thought it'd be <laughs> somebody else. Yeah, and the far back there in the corner, you had your hand up there. None of our none of our manufacturing facilities before had cooling on them. Yeah, yeah. So we we ran the numbers on it and came back with the reason that we went with the chilled water is simply because of the energy efficiencies, because of the lifespan of the equipment that we wanted, and because you got a 12 acre roof. And in winter time, Iowa winters can be harsh. I didn't want to have my guys up there trying to do maintenance or service work on that. Plus, it's it's a um, it's a TPO roof. So if you have a compressor go down in the middle of 12 acres, it, it, how do you get it out of there, right? You can't get equipment up there. We, we looked at gantry cranes, we looked at all kinds of different things. And, and ultimately it come back to, we put the chiller plant in because it was expandable. So we got 6,000 tons, we can expand that to the rest of the campus and we felt like that was the right decision. But we didn't have, we didn't have actual data, it was just all running off the numbers. We had a question here at the end of this table. Yeah, I was just going to ask about factory testing on the chillers. I don't know if you guys mentioned that at all like prior to getting to the site. Uh, on, your, on the original ones, it, what Heath did mention, that the, the second time around, they were out there for the factory uh, chiller testing. Now, yeah, initially, we, do you know there was a factory chiller testing? I know we personally weren't part of that. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't originally part of that. Sure, sure. So, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, at that point, maybe they would have caught it. Early if you the one. For sure. Yep, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Yeah, a question here. Yeah, on the uh, commissioning the paint system there, so I always work with manufacturing. Is there a global sequence for how that assembly line is supposed to work and then dive into each of the individual components once you understand that? Or is it just sections of systems and you guys had to assemble all that and figure out how to make it work? 
So that's a good question. So, uh, so Heath, uh, from a Vermeer standpoint, so th there was no design. So this was fur you know furnished through Vermeer. They did have some of the, some of his staff who runs the paint line, kind of kind of gave us guidance on what's the overall sequence of operation. In fact, that's where that goal of the you know X amount of pieces of equipment. In fact, I think Heath, you've mentioned to me earlier that we're exceeding that now by like mm -hmm. three or something per hour. So we did we did work in conjunction with Vermeer mm -hmm. on getting that initial, you know, what's the end goal and then working individually with all the manufacturers on on how to you know, how to make that happen. Yeah. So. so just something about the paint line. Something that's really interesting about that paint line is so that paint line uh, it has code readers on the top of it. So when you load a part on there, it, you manually scan that in. And some of those parts go through the blaster, some of them don't go through the blaster, and they all, they're all tracked throughout the, through that entire mile. So you can tell where that part is at any time in that, in that uh, process. And that's important because you have people in the assembly that are waiting for that part, so you have to make sure that it comes off. So part of the, the problem that we had was to make sure that those things tracked accordingly and made sure that it picked up the points. And, and if we lost power and it come back on, we still had to know where those parts were, otherwise you're just running blind, and you got a mile worth of parts that nobody knows where they are. That was the reason for we put the air chiller on. We put the air chiller on the back, it's a 300 ton air chiller. We also run process loads on that, so we have another building that's out back. They run a lot of dyno testing, and so we put uh, heat exchangers on the dyno equipment to where we can pull the heat loads off of there. Um, and then, like I say, in the, in the one day out of the year in March where we get a nice day, which seems like that's all we're getting right now, um, we'll, we'll turn the air chiller on. Yeah, I just put through up the, the eight different conveyors. And, and one of the challenges with the commissioning, I remember, is just the timing and the interaction because you're going from one conveyor to the next or maybe another one and, and the timing of, of mm -hmm. the speed. You know, for each one of those, are all separate. Yeah, they separate run. Loops. They all run at different speeds. They're power and free conveyors. Some some of them run at sixteen. Some of them run at eight, and then they ramp back up. And how do? You, and there's multiple different lines. So there's two lines there now, and we can add a third line, and then we can add a powder coat line off to the side. So how do? You, how are you able to track where that's all going when they're running at different rates? They're running in different locations and be able to come back. And, and the guys who worked on that, I mean, Pablo was the project manager and, and we were involved, but we did have a team that came in from our Phoenix office and they, um, you know, they're, they're not big on public speaking. So we're speaking <laughs> for them, uh, but they, they, really, they, they really figured it out and did well with it. And so we were, um, we were pleased and, you know, Heath was pleased and, and mm -hmm. so credit where it's due. All right. Perfect. Thank Thanks you guys. Everybody.